Lord, inspire us with your word. May it truly be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our lives. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we embark on a journey of discovery a long time ago, only to discover many things about ourselves. And one of the discoveries is that what really seemed to matter at one point may be less prominent in our priorities today. It isn't so much the answers that we get as we go through the journey, as it is the journey itself. To come together in prayer, in Bible study, in discernment, that we might live in faithful relationship to God. How important it is to discover that God can be trusted. That Christ liberates us from all false allegiances to the one and only that matters. We're going to walk with Moses on the month of September to reminded, be reminded of our own life's journeys and that that journey, our journey, is defined in our relationship to God and in our particular journey in this church, with this community, with Jesus Christ. Now first, as you heard that scripture read this morning, there's a problem that comes to mind right away. The Exodus story was written in a time when thought patterns were way different from our thought patterns. The authors that lived then worked a lot and spoke a lot through supernatural activity. The idea that God brought judgment against evil and upon evil people was commonplace in those times. The Old Testament commentator and professor Walter Brueggemann said, Yet not even these or similar explanations resolve the problem of Yahweh, the bringer of death. And the only valid means of moving beyond this difficulty into genuine values of this text is to admit the understanding of Yahweh as the deity who slaughters the firstborn is partial and therefore distorted. One may understand why the ancient writers conceptualized God as they did in light of their other biblical insights into the nature of God. One must also deny the portrait of Yahweh as the killer of innocent. Now, Rugeman goes on to use other examples like the prophets, Isaiah and Jonah, who viewed redemption through both God's people and through their enemies. That it was important, the important thing in those prophetic writings was that God's love remained. He also likened it to the passion of Jesus demonstrated to those who crucified him. We must look through this dark lens that's hard to look through, through this vision of destruction that we heard about, to find a God who saves. And this isn't easy to do. It's hard to put our minds in a place and a people whose connection to animals and blood sacrifices relates to their identity with their God. These symbols Symbolic actions help to reinforce their sacred relationship to God. The application of blood to the doors of the Israelite houses is a marker to the Lord to spare those within. Everyone else is subjected to the divine wrath, even the firstborn of the animals suffer for Pharaoh's hard-heartedness. You know, if you think about it, there have been many times in our history, in history, where innocent people suffer for the sins of their leaders. According to commentary writer Christopher Hayes, this punishment of Egypt is modest by comparison to other punishments such as the flood or the destruction that's uh, promised in all the apocalyptic passages, particularly 2nd Isaiah or the New Testament writings in Luke even. Any kind of suffering makes us uncomfortable. It makes us question how come this has to happen? How can it happen? It challenges our religious sense of what kind of God would do this. We're stuck in the story with the picture of the Hebrew family smearing blood thickly over their doorposts as God's destroyer passes over their loved ones. The triumph of Israel is embedded in the tears of Egypt. It's costly liberation to be sure. This kind of deliverance is hard to swallow. 
The second thing we need to look at is the particular, the text, the Passover. Let's return to the text. God declares the month and the year of the Passover and gives the people instructions to what they are to do. This certainly marks for them a rite of passage. He's telling them, you're going to celebrate this yearly at this time. Recall that the people of Israel have been instructed to eat the Passover meal hurriedly with sandals on their feet. They have to be ready to move with God at any minute. The Passover story is unique to them. If you look up the word Passover in the dictionary, it says, a holiday for Jews celebrating their deliverance from slavery in ancient Egypt. Now the children's Bible will give it a little more meat. It says, Passover is a name given to the night that God killed the firstborn sons of the Egyptians but passed over Israelite families. God told the Israelites to hold a special meal each year on that date. The Passover meal helps Jewish families remember that God saved their ancestors when they were slaves in Egypt. Passover is a particular relationship between God and God's chosen people of Israel. It takes place at a time when they're displaced from their home. They're finding their way to faithfulness in a foreign land. The role of memory is very, very important. In fact, verse 14 says, this, this day shall be a day of remembrance for you. Remembrance. That word happens many, many times in the Bible. In fact, in the Old Testament Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, the word remember is used 28 times. And if you look in a, a, a concordance, you'll find it many, many other times in the Bible. Remembrance is how we maintain our faith. It is how the faith community recalls who they are as God's people. The story of the Passover calls them to remember and preserve the conditions under which their faith is enacted as a perpetual ordinance. Now, how might we think about Passover and reflect upon it? I, I brought some questions to, to consider. Can we relate to Israel's Exodus journey? I think the answer is yes. We are all on a life's journey. Are we prepared to move with God into our unknown future as they did? Are we free to follow Jesus regardless of the cost? Or are we weighted down by things, by our stuff, like possessions, expectations, our own sense of responsibility that overrides everything else? Is God first in our life? And when I start naming these things that pull us down, it just brings to light the stresses that we all carry. We are stressed out people, much like they are. And here's a little quote to consider. Stressed out? Don't give up. Moses was once a basket case. <laughs> <laughs> The third thing to consider is the pertinent. How do we connect with this story, this ancient story? It comes to us, to us, to this community, in the context of Jesus Christ. Passover was the way he understood his earthly foundation in the unique and particular role of Savior that only he would fill. The Passover framework reminds us that our liberation came with death and suffering. It reminds us of God whose love and longing for us is more than we could ever, ever imagine. God goes to greater lengths to save us, more than we are ever, even able to fully comprehend. Keith Watkins, in his book, The Great Thanksgiving, writes this, as the incarnation of God, the Holy One, Jesus makes possible the extension of the faith of Abraham and Moses to the people outside of Judaism. He transforms the cultic life of his ancestors saying no to its detail and saying yes to the basic spirit of the existing system of life in the presence of God. Jesus came to Jerusalem at the feast of the Passover as it drew near. He was in serious conflict 
with the religious leaders as well as the political leaders. Late in that final week of his life, he set himself on a course of action that he would not deviate from. On Thursday evening of the day of the preparation for Passover, he and his disciples gathered together for their regular meal, the Passover meal. Following the traditional practice, he blessed the bread and broke it and distributed it. He then said something to them they had not heard before. My body given for you. When you do this, remember me. And then after that same meal, he followed the traditional ceremonies with a cup of wine, using the words of history and Jewish tradition. Again, offering new words of ordinance to them. My blood of the covenant poured out for you. When you do this, do it to remember me. We know the story of what happened after this. We know what transpired. He was arrested and brought through hearings before various authorities, and while not guilty, was stretched out on a cross to die. For his friends and the followers, the sacrificial language of the Passover came at that night to new understanding. This distinctive remembrance of Jesus with bread and a wine established a Christian meal that recites God's saving work through Jesus Christ. The themes, the prayers, the liturgy are similar, but exact words vary slightly as faith communities work out their own way of understanding what that meal means and how they're going to express it in their worship. <coughs> Today, we remember Jesus in the apostolic <coughs> tradition, which defines worship by means of the Lord's Supper. We, disciples of Christ, are a people of the table. In Jane McAvoy's book, Table Talk, she recites a quote by Proctor Smith. The communion table speaks to us of precious blood that has the wonder-working power to remain in relation with us into and through the depths of our lives. In the sharing of this meal, as we come to the table, we have an opportunity to meet the risen Christ, and we have the opportunity to be transformed to do his work. The Passover, tra trans or the Passover tradition is somewhat translated into our Christian tradition because of Jesus' faithful observance and through Jesus' words. In Jesus, the monotheistic relation of Judaism took a new and decisive embodiment. Eating and drinking with God has long been a way to express relationship, has long, all the way through the Bible, been an important part of people's faith. The meal of remembrance that we come and share each Sunday becomes the anchor for every single thing that we do. It is our celebration of the new life that God brings to us. May we continue to discover Christ in the sharing of the bread and the cup.